Okay, hello everybody. Uh, this is our online journal club, 17th online journal club. Hello to all of you and thank you very much for joining us. Today, we are going to discuss about uh, what happened around implants and crown when we are dealing with them in terms of the caries and preapical lesion, which is published by Professor Jorge Martins from Lisbon University. So we have Professor Sanjay Miglani with us who joined the head of the educational committee. I know he is not actually similar to me, he is not at home, but I'm going to ask Sanjay to start the session officially. Sanjay, please. Hello everyone and good evening from Dubai. Uh, I'm just out for family vacation and uh, I wish this program a great success and uh, Dr. Nikopar is doing a good job and my best wishes to the authors and to all the listeners. Thank you very much, Sanjay. And we have all of our friends from around the world and thank you very much for joining us uh, from everywhere. Okay, Dilek, uh, before I ask you to officially start, I'm going to ask Professor Georgia Martins to give us an introduction and then we will start and ask you to start. Professor Georgia Martins, from Lisbon University. Well, first of all, um, thank you very much for your kind words. Uh, I would like to thank the invitation from uh, Professor Mohamed Nikofar to be here and uh, to have the chance to see our work being presented at uh, such a high level, like uh, uh, these Asia Pacific Confederation meetings. And uh, it's a big honor to be here. I have seen uh, multiple uh, sessions previously, and uh, uh, it's a, a big honor to be here. I would like also to thank Dilek uh, uh, Ozer for the presentation that she's uh, about to start and the critical analysis that uh, she's about to, to, to perform. And uh, um, I have seen already uh, multiple um, personalities from endodontic field from many countries are, are already. So uh, I, I will not mention anyone in particular, but uh, I will thank you everyone for being here and to participate in this session. Thank you very much. I have received actually a message uh, from somebody that they cannot hear us very well. I think it's necessary for them to uh, go out and come back again. Sometimes it's the problem of their system. Okay, Dilek, please share your presentation and okay. start. You may introduce yourself to us as well. Okay, hello everybody. My name is Dilek Azar and I'm a lecturer in Ankara Medical University. Uh, thank you for Dr. Nekofar and uh, APEC Confederation for inviting me to this meeting. Uh, I hope this will be a helpful meeting and I want to share my uh, slides. Can you see the PowerPoint? Yes, we can see that very well. Yes, okay, then uh, I want to start now if you are ready. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, hi again to everybody. Uh, welcome to the 15th APEC Online Endodontic Journal Club meeting. Today's article is published in International Endodontic Journal in 2022. And the title of the article is Prevalence of Periapical Lesions, Root Canal Treatments and Restorations in Teeth Adjacent to Implant or Tooth Supported Crowns. And also, this is a multicenter cross sectional study. And the authors are Aboyomi Baruwa, George Martins. He is with us now to answer us questions. Beatrice Pereira, Joa Merinos, Ronald Ordinalio Zapata, Eric Souza, and Antonio Gengera. Okay, Dilek, before you go ahead, go back to previous slide. If Jorge wants to say something about this okay. team, please go ahead, Jorge. 
Thank you. Um, regarding our team, it's a, a team uh, made of uh, uh, some of them are quite uh, well known, such as uh, Ronald Ordinal Zapata and Eric Souza. So I guess they don't need any kind of presentation. Uh, regarding the main author, uh, Barua, Abayomi Barua and Beatriz Pereira, the third author and fourth author, João Mirinhos, they were um, at a few, a few years ago when we started developing this study. Uh, they were, they finished two years ago. They were the PJ students from our specialty program, which is a certified program uh, by the European Society of Endodontology. It's one of the very few programs that are certified, three years full time programs. And uh, one of the major um, uh, Goals or one of the major tasks they have to accomplish is to perform a research project, uh, and this is how this was their research project, uh, which we'll talk a little bit later if you allow us. Uh, but they were basically um, uh, students, and they are going very well currently uh, on their academic uh, um, uh, path and uh, on their clinical path too. And Antonio Gingera, the last one, is the program director, so he's a quite well-known person too. Um, and uh, so he, he was the, one of the orientations of the group. So um, that's the- uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. Dilek, please. Okay, I'm going on. Uh, first, I want to start with the introduction. Uh, there were a lot of studies about the implant and tooth supported crowns in dental literature. But the vast majority of studies that have been published regarding the survival rate and studies of implant and tooth supported crowns ignore the treatment consequences in the adjacent teeth. Some studies mention the effects on teeth that are adjacent to the restored edentulous spaces documenting associated complications such as caries, periodontal disease, and tooth loss. And the few published studies have reported inconsistent results on the status of teeth adjacent to implants. And however, there's a consensus that the loss of proximal contact is an issue that may lead to a deleterious effect on these teeth. And these studies have documented the incidence of caries and periapical lesions on adjacent teeth using follow-up clinical records based on periapical films or digital radiographs, which display a well-known lower sensitivity when compared to the com-beam computed tomography. And CBCT imaging, we all know, provides a three-dimensional volume with the opportunity to adjust several image visualization settings and filters, enabling a more accurate diagnosis. Okay, and uh, so, sorry, Dilek, Dilek, can I interrupt okay. you? Can you go back okay. to the slides back, please? Okay. One more. Okay. Yeah, here, uh, out of the article, it mentions that there is a consensus that uh, the loss of proximal contacts is an issue that may lead to a deleterious effect on the teeth. Uh, yes. Georgia, do you think this con uh, for this consensus, can you tell us a bit more? Because that means we already have enough evidence for such a thing, do we? Um, what has been reported, and uh, as it has been well pointed here by the errors by uh, Delitech OZ, is that on that uh, spaces where the missed contact is not, uh, the, the contact point is not working, so we have a missed contact point, you may have uh, some uh, um, accumulation of uh, uh, not only food packing, uh, which may change the, the, uh, the bacteria that may, may be living there, but also it may work as a, uh, an area where the, um, the decays, especially near the, the, the crowns of implants, where the, the, uh, the microbiota that lives there is a little bit different from a natural tooth. 
it may indeed lead to um, some changes uh, which may indeed uh, lead to a deleterious effect. This is um, something that has been reported mostly on studies related with prostodontics, uh, not so much endodontics. So we had in our, in our um, background research, we had to, to get some support from uh, other fields. Okay. Um, and in the next the slide, also, if uh, Dilek go to the next slide. Okay. This in one. Next slide, I'm a bit worried about the use of CBCT for diagnosis because uh, I agree about the possibility to diagnose about the preapical lesion easier in CBCT, obviously. But in terms of detecting the caries, I think CBCT is not going to help a lot. What is your explanation for that, George? That is a very good point. Um, when um, multiple studies have indeed shown that uh, um, the 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 periapical lesions, the sensibility of the device as a diagnostic tool of the CBCT when compared to other uh, diagnostic tools, such as um, the radiographs, which are another imaging tool, um, it's, it's, very, it's much higher for the CBCT. So indeed, um, the, the ability to, to detect these uh, lesions, it's uh, much more favorable on, uh, on this kind of, uh, of diagnostic tools regarding, regarding the, um, let me just double check here something, regarding the, the lesions. Mm -hmm. However, when you talk about the, the decay, that is indeed, the, or the caries lesion, that is indeed something that we really felt that uh, it was more difficult to assess. So at a certain point, we, we started to have into consideration not if the tooth have had decay or not, but if the teeth were restored or not restored, exactly because, as you mentioned, the sensibility to detect caries lesions is it's difficult, more difficult in the, in the convenient com computer tomographies, exactly because this transition between the, the, um, the high atomic uh, structure, such as the, uh, the NML or previous restorations, makes to the, to the area with a, a low atomic uh, density, makes this type of images that may work as an artifact. So I, I believe that uh, detecting the periapical lesions is obviously the sensibility of the device of the convenient computer tomography is indeed there higher. The ability to detect previous root canal treatments is it's obvious. I think both of them, x-rays and the CVCT shows them very well. The, the, the caries, I don't think it's um, uh, a very, uh, it does not, it might not have, it might not be the best uh, device to show, the, the best uh, uh, diagnostic to, to show caries, but it can indeed show uh, re restorations. That's why in this particular study, we have split it only in two portions, in two groups. The restored and non-restored teeth it was exactly because that, uh, that situation that uh, you mentioned so well. Okay, thank you. Professor Vatampur has got a question. Please go ahead. Uh, hello, everybody. I have a question, uh, dear professor. Uh, I want to know that how did you differ uh, between uh, SCAR and uh, lesion, apical lesion? That is a very good question. One of the, one of the, uh, one of the things that we had to establish in the beginning was exactly the fact that we had to be able to classify the, the periapical lesions. So uh, in that, in that uh, matter of fact, we have followed a previous paper that uh, from Strela et al. from 2008, with, which has classified the, the, the lesions according to five states. 
And uh, in those five states, one of them has no, no lesions and the other ones have uh, several types of, uh, uh, of configurations that uh, may indeed be classified as a, as a lesion. In this case, uh, the, what we have decided was to uh, classify as a lesion anything that was uh, heavy, as, and uh, I'm, I'm saying according uh, to Estrela et al. So he has uh, anything that would go above the a diameter, a radially sensitive diameter above 0 0.5 millimeters could fit in, a, in what can be defined as a peripical lesion. So they have classified five stages and the minimal stage to classify a peripical lesion was above 0 0.5. So when the peripical um, width of the periodontal ligament was under 0 0.5 millimeters, we classified it as uh, not presenting a peripical lesion, anything that would present above 0 0.5, we classified it as having a peripical lesion. Bilek, okay. please carry on. Oh, uh, okay. Batam, do you want to add anything? No, only I want to mention that uh, the categorization of sterile is uh, right for a non-treated tooth. But I think for, uh, for example, in uh, picture B, uh, that the tooth is treated previously, it is completely possible that uh, we have scar instead of a, a periapical lesion. And uh, this can be uh, overestimated our results in the next section. I understand your point. Um, first of all, it's important to understand this is a B-dimensional image, right? So when we were assessing the CBCTs and uh, a two-dimensional image, we were able to rotate the image and see a little bit better. Uh, and obviously there are the scars. It's something that it's very difficult for us in any CBCT to determine. So uh, in this case, we had to follow some kind of methodology that would be replicatable and uh, not something that could be addressed as something more qualitative. We, we were needing to be something more quantitative. So although um, uh, I understand your point, which makes completely sense, and I would like to thank you for that comment, um, we indeed, uh, had the, the, the need to classify it according to something that was clear to be understood and that could be replicated without uh, uh, what we call the observer bias, which is something that each observer may think this may be a scar or this may not be a scar. So we go from something that is very difficult to get a standard between observers. We had five observers working on this because the volume of that was very big. So we really need something that could be more quantitative, something that everyone could follow and could uh, uh, guide themselves by that, uh, by that uh, situation. So I agree with you, some of these cases, we might have gone through some situations. And there are a few studies that uh, address them. And I think we debate that on this paper also, if not on this paper, on the other papers of this series that there are uh, some uh, CVCT studies that talk about the uh, overdiagnosis, which is something that uh, we spoke uh, for a while when we were doing the, the reliability uh, tests and the, the patronization of this, uh, the, the standardization hey. of the protocols. And okay, uh, that's great. Uh, Jorge, sorry to interrupt you, but because we are going to discuss a lot, we need, I need to control the time. So okay, no let's, let's okay. delay, carry on, and then we come back to this point. Thank you very much for the question and for the answer. Delay, okay. please. Okay, I'm going on. Uh, so the aim of this cross-sectional multi-center study was to document the prevalence of periapical lesions root canal treatments and crown restorations, which were called as primary outcomes in the study on teeth adjacent to both implant and tooth supported crowns on an adult population assessed by CBCT imaging. And the null hypothesis was that there is no differences in the frequency of the primary outcomes 
when comparing teeth adjacent and non-adjacent to implant and tooth supported crowns. And let's see the materials and methods. The study design follows the strengthening the reporting of observational studies in epidemiology, which we know as trough statements, and also received ethics committee approval from Lisbon University. And uh, a group of samples consisting of 1,249 TBCT volumes performed between January uh, 2012 to February 2020 at 11 health centers. And this study followed a previous published methodology used in a similar subpopulation. And when we looked at the table two, uh, we can see the characteristics of the assessed and included uh, subpopulations and samples in here. Uh, 22,899 teeth were secreted from 1,000 249 patients. And the number of uh, adjacent to implant supported crowns were 545 teeth, and the number of teeth adjacent to natural teeth supported crowns were 1316. And also, we can see the other details of the sample groups in table two. To standardize the parameters of the CBCT exams inc uh, included only full arch volumes with a maximum 200 micron voxel size and 94 kilovolts and 40 milliamperes were selected. Uh, although the imaging visualization software was not the same amongst the health centers, similar so uh, software functionalities were used and all CBCT exams were pre-existing as none of them performed with the sole purpose of the present study. And third molars, unsalvageable roots and impacted teeth, scans with imaging artifacts were excluded from this study. The overall exclusion rate was under 3% of the initial available sample. And there were five examiners in the study. They were all endodontists uh, with experience working with CBCT imaging software. And they were instructed to follow a standard and strict step-by-step -step assessment protocol, screening of every tooth or root in the axial, coronal, and sagittal planes after a proper three-dimensional alignment of the imaging software reference lines with the long axis of the tooth and root, and all examiners pre-calibrated against a gold standard. And in here, I have a question, the first question to the author, uh, Dr. Martin. Um, I want to ask that, uh, how did you do the pre-calibration and what was the gold standards you mentioned in here? Could you please describe to us? Okay, George, have you? Yes, I was I was turning on the, the, the okay, microphone. Yes, please. You, you can so, keep it. You can keep it on because uh, your system is very nice. We don't have any noise from that. You can keep it on. Please right. go ahead. So in the beginning, we were addressing the, the the assessments with five observers exactly because we had the need to, as you showed very well in the previous uh, slides. The, the, um, the amount of volume that we had to collect it had to be very high because there are not many cases of teeth adjacent to implants. So we had to collect more than 20,000 teeth. So we could have a final sample of 500 teeth adjacent to implants. So we had the need to collect a, a large volume of data. Uh, and that's why we had, uh, uh, we had performed this with multiple observers. So we could have more persons working on this. And that's why we have used the multi-center study. Uh, the the multi-center study is something that has uh, advantages and disadvantages. One of the disadvantages, as you showed very well in, the, in one of the previous slides, is the fact that some characteristics of the CPCTs were slightly different. Al although we, we, we made some limits to the, to the uh, 
to the characteristics to the of, of the city cities uh, and uh, uh, and we all we request also full arches uh, let me just uh, highlight this full arches screens uh, why we felt this was important uh, exactly because it's a little bit different from the concept of an anatomy because in these cases we were looking for periapical lesions so if we were addressing small volumes we were not sure if that small volumes were requested because any endodontic problem was happening and uh, that uh, could uh, uh, lead to some bias because we could have some uh, CDC small volumes CVCTs that could be asked because of a particular endodontic problem so we request only full arches and uh, they are pre calibrated against the gold standards and now answering directly to your question uh, was that we needed to put these five observers making the same kind of assessment so in the beginning when we we're doing the inter-rater and the inter-rater uh, reliability tests in the beginning before anything we just sit down on a room and uh, the five observers and we start seeing cvcts that did not enter on the final pool of the of data so we just uh, i believe we saw something like uh, more than 200 teeth and uh, we just started uh, uh, defining to ourselves and debating all five together if that was a lesion if that was not a lesion if that was a root canal treatment if that was not a root canal treatment according to the guidelines that we made before so first we did the guidelines that we sent for ethical commission approval so the protocol was completely designed with the inclusion and exclusion criteria still at all uh, definition and then uh, before we started we sit all together and we try to apply it on multiple city volumes and that's what we call the pre-calibrated so we all did the evaluation on the same teeth together the five together uh, and then we defined that as the gold standard uh, because we all reached a consensus um, uh, definition of if that particular lesion that we were seeing was or not a periapical lesion. And we did this every three months because the, the process was very long. And, and to make sure that no one was going to deviate, make a deviation regarding the analysis that we want to conduct, and regarding the, the standardization we, that we want everyone to be assessing the same way, we performed the evaluation of these same CVCTs. I think it was 10 CVCTs in more than 20, uh, 200 teeth. We, every three months we would join and we would review those 200, more than 200 uh, teeth to determine, okay, are we still evaluating every, everything the same way? Did we change along the process? Did we change the way we are evaluating the things? So that's what we call the gold standard. So pre-calibrate because we all sit together to evaluate the same CBCTs and we define that correctly or incorrectly, but we define it as a gold standard because everyone uh, uh, concluded that those evaluations were being made in the same way. So, and if any any uh, divergence was happening, we debated it. So everyone could be assessing the CVCTs exactly the same way when everyone was going on to the field uh, individually. Thank you very much. There is another question by Professor Vatampur, uh, and I also have a question. But Professor Vatampur, you go first. Okay, uh, dear Dr. Martin, I have a question about your sample size. Uh, as you know. Um, according to the stroke checklist, you, it should be clear the sample size reason, uh, determination reason in the method, uh, method section, but I didn't find it. What was your um, reason for uh, determination of such sample size in your study? Okay, that's a very good question. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, in this case, um, we have, uh, we, we, what we did was a convenience sample. This was a convenience sample. So we just reached the databases and we just start screening from CVCT1 to the last CVCT. So we could have the maximum number of, of cases involved because we knew ahead from our 
clinical experiences that these cases are not um, uh, are not uh, um, very very common. So we, we would have difficulties to reach the, this this kind of samples. Um, uh, if, if we take a look, twenty thousand teeth means that uh, we got to 500 teeth so uh, adjacent to implant so if we were checking just 2000 we would have 50 cases so 50 cases nothing it's very few so in this case our sample size was something uh, as simple as let's try to get the most cases that we can get so we can have the the most powerful uh, sample size that we can get and in the end we would check if we, we would uh, uh, if the, the, the good statistics, if we could get uh, the difference that we want to prove or not. But in this case, we were not aiming to any specific uh, sample size. We just aimed to get the maximum number of cases, even because there, there, there was no study before this following this type of methodology. So we have no, no reference. So we just tried to collect the maximum we could. Um, and my question, Professor Martins, is about uh, the type of the study, because this is a cross-sectional study, and obviously it is possible to have some caries uh, before the initiation of the endodontic treatment and before the initiation of the crown or the implant. And then we already have another treatment on the two that you think this is adjacent to the crown. So uh, we don't know which one was the first. How do you manage that? That is a very important question, and we we spent some time debating that. Um, this is a. So it's good a to have to good to to know how do you manage this methodology for the audience. I think this is very important part. Please explain that for us. Okay. We will learn from. That. It's very important to understand uh, what we aim for with a cross-sectional study. So the cross-sectional study is a, a study, it's an uh, epidemiological study where you check uh, one point in time, the data. So you are not checking two points in time. So you cannot uh, perform the evaluation and the follow-up as you so well mentioned. Um, so in this case, we, what we can determine is the prevalence. Uh, if we have two points in time, we could determine what we call the incidence which is the, 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 the emergence of new cases. In this case, since we can only uh, detect one point in time, we can detect the prevalence. Why is this important? Because what we want, what the only thing that we can define on a cross-national study is that at that point in time, do we have or do we not have a higher percentage of cases according to the groups? This is the only thing we can have. So the cross-sectional studies is a very good uh, methodology and study design to determine hypotheses for further studies. So I guess in the next step, what could be done was exactly perform a, a study with a follow-up, which could, could be um, a, longitudinal, a longitudinal, longitudinal study, for instance, a cohort, where you could have an exposed group and a non-exposed group, right? For instance, in the, starting from a point zero uh, after the placement of the implant, if uh, it developed or not uh, cons uh, a consequence to that implant. So it's, it's important to understand what the cross-sectional study means. Cross-sectional study is just one point in time. We are not able to assess what happened before and we are not able to assess what happened after. But we know that at that point in time, we had higher or lower percentage of lesions according to the group. And this will generate new hypotheses for further studies, which should be longitudinal, trying to understand the evolution of the of the cases after the, the implant placement. But as a cross-sectional okay. study, that is only able to measure that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we will carry on, and we are still waiting for others if they want to add any comment. Uh, so, Dilek, please go ahead. Okay, I'm going. And uh, to each examination, gender, age, and two type were recorded. We see before in the table two. Mm -hmm. And for each tooth, following data were collected. And the questions were 
Adjacent position to an implant supported crown, yes or no? Adjacent position to a natural tooth supported crown, yes or no? Periapical lesion, yes or no? If there is periapical lesion, then periapical index score one to five. If the periapical lesion is absent, then the score is zero. And root canal pulling, yes or no? And tooth restorative status, restored or unrestored? And if the tooth was multi-rooted, then they were categorized according to the root with the worst outcome. The assessment protocol was reviewed by everyone every three months, and the observers calibrated once again as the original gold standard. Prior to data assessment, all five examiners were subjected to intra and inter-rater reliability tests by assessing the same 10 pre-selected CBCT volumes, twice with a period of four weeks in between evaluation and the Cohen's kappa and interclass correlation coefficient were used, and the scores were considered reliable if above 0.60. And this study's results were, intra-rater score were above 6, 0.60, and inter-rater results were both above 0.90. And SPSS software version, 24 and the generalizing estimating equation tests were used. And when a tooth is adjacent or not to an implant supported crown, they named as predictor one. And when tooth is adjacent or not to a natural tooth supported crown, they named as predictor two. And odds ratio and confidence intervals for the dependent variables, periapical lesion, root canal pulling and tooth restorative status for both predictors were obtained and the significance level was set at 0 0.05. And now uh, look at the, uh, when we look at the results, we can first, uh, we can see the table three. In table three, uh, the frequency of root canal pulling, periapical lesion and tooth restorative status uh, in both implant and natural tooth supported models, considering the overall data we can see in this table, uh, from the 1,249 TBCT volumes obtained data from 22,899 teeth were recorded, as we said before, and root canal filling and restorative status were found to be significant for both predictors, while the periodical lesions was not significant in here. You can see in here. Mm -hmm. And in the bottom of the table three, it is written that adjacent, ad adjacent stands for both anterior and posterior positioning in relation to the SS tooth. And I want to ask a question to Dr. Martins in here. Uh, Dilek, there... Dilek, okay. before you go okay. for your question, I want to ask uh, George if he wants to add anything to this table, then okay. please go on and ask your question. Because I, okay. I, I, I believe it is important for all of us to understand this table very well. Yes. George, do you want to add any, any description to what uh, Dilek said, or you're happy about what we listened? Um... Dr. Dillard has ex exposed very well. Uh, what I, I would like to highlight here is that um, it's the, the, the differences of the percentages. Uh -huh. So when we, when we look at this table, uh, we see that uh, there is a, um, even on the cases of the periapical lesions, and this was uh, the main uh, target of our research, but even on the cases that we, we do not have uh, a statistical significance expression, we can see that the percentage is more than the double. Uh, and in the, in the case of the natural tools um, to the support crown, it's almost, it's more than a triple. So, it's not only the fact that uh, there is a higher percentage of root canal filling and uh, there is a higher percentage of restorative, 
but uh, although without significance, there is a clear tendency for a, a higher periodical lesions. Obviously, then we go back to that uh, question that you made so well and so wisely, which is, this is a one point in time evaluation. So this is a cross-sectional study. So obviously more uh, informations are indeed required, but this is a, 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 a very important uh, warning that would, uh, could make us think, usually what we like to, usually we think that uh, the previous root canal filled teeth deserve uh, um, a, a careful follow-up, right? We know that these cases have a, uh, a higher percentage of the, of a periodical lesion. So usually on the follow-ups, on the checkups that we do with the, with the patients, with the appointments, usually, usually we take a, a, a closer look to these cases. Some do, sometimes we do panoramics and we try to look at these cases if there's any problem there. So usually the, the previous root canal treated teeth, they deserve a special attention from us. I believe that these cases, adjacent to implants, should also have a special attention when we are doing the analysis of the patient status. Uh, even not having the significance, they tend to, to have a, a higher percentage of cases. One point, one point in time evaluation, as you so well mentioned. Okay, uh, there are two questions from uh, our colleagues, Professor Vatampur first and then Professor Osgood. Okay, Professor Vatampur. Okay, if it's possible, uh, please uh, show the previous slide. Dilek, please, please, previous slide, Dilek. Okay. Thank you. Hmm. No, no. Yeah, yes. Next. Table three? No, the no. previous slide about the statistical methods. Ah, okay. The statistical analysis? This yes. one? Yes. Yes, yes. okay. Uh, okay. I want to know uh, some things about statistical analysis. According to the title of the article, this, uh, this study is a prevalence study. First of all, in these such studies, we want to know what is the prevalence rate. And the another thing is that odds ratio is suitable for case control studies, not for um, prevalence studies. Uh, and because of this matter, I think the p-values that showed in the next slide in the table, I think one, it is not uh, suitable and is not uh, logical because from the first of the study, the samples was not, were, not, um, deter were not divided into two groups or uh, so on. And at the first, you had only one groups. And after collecting your data, you divided into several two groups and uh, analyzed it based on your data. I think, for example, in the, uh, if it's possible in uh, table one, if it's possible. Dilek, can you go to table one, please, if you okay. have it? Okay, okay, table one. Yes. Uh, that's table. Two, that's no, what you mentioned. Result. Table two. Result section. Oh, okay. Table, table three. Table, table three. three. Okay. I am sorry, three. Dilek. Thank you very much. <laughs> not, not at all. Ah, here. Here. Uh, for example, adjacent in the implant supported crown, you had uh, one hundred sixty-three sample against the non-adjacent 2,334. Uh, These are uh, not equal sample size in these two groups. And also in another adjacent in the natural to support it, 589 and 1,900. Mm -hmm. And I think because of this difference, it is not logical, these p-values, and we cannot judge about these results. I want to know what is the- Okay, George, uh, please go ahead. And then after that, we have two more questions. So please answer very quickly. 
Okay, this is a good point. Statistical analysis is always something that is uh, um, very important to, um, to, to consider. Um, regarding the odds ratio, there is uh, two types of um, ratio. We have the odds ratio and the relative risk. Uh, usually, the, on the prevalence studies, we, usual, we usually use the odds ratio. Um, this is what I have learned. That, uh, that does not mean that I'm correct, but it is it's what I have learned. And uh, it's what we have published previously in multiple studies, and it's what we have um, submitted to the journal, and uh, which went through the statistical reviewer of the journal, which uh, confirmed the statistic was correct. I'm not a biostatistician, as you can understand. I'm a clinician and I'm a dentist. So usually I back up always on the biostatistician that works with us. Uh, so I just asked uh, how can we do the analysis on this data? And uh, we went from a, stratific a stratification first, where we have uh, uh, made very uh, specific groups. First, we were eliminating the root canal, well, uh, typical stratifications. So first we do the, the root canal filling on the second group, we eliminate the root canal filling on the third group, we eliminate the the, the two restorative, restorative status and we could understand the evolution of the results. In this case, the biostatistician asked us to, to, to conduct a multivariable analysis so we could uh, have in consideration the patient because the fact that the patient was something very important. These results here that we see in the periodical lesions, we could detect um, a difference on the on, if we conduct this same uh, results that we have here under an analysis without considering uh, the, the 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 multivariable analysis, we could have a, 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 a significant difference also in the practical lesions. But we have to take into into consideration the patient as a factor because patients, some patients may have more lesions than other patients. You, you, we can see that in the clinics, we see that some patients are perfect on their oral health and other patients have multiple uh, lesions. So we could understand that. So the biostatistician asked us to conduct it and he helped us to conduct it, the, the multivariable analysis that you, you see there. And, and in this uh, situation, he didn't see any any problem regarding the the differences of the of the numbers, which indeed are very high. But uh, we could not balance these these uh, these these groups. We even spoke. Uh, I think one of the um, one of the conversations we had was if we if it would make sense to perform. Uh, imagine on this one, 162 teeth. You can see there adjacent implant, 162 teeth. And I asked him, what about limiting the other one, the other groups only to 162 also, so we have an even. And what he told me, it makes sense. So you are evening the sample size, but you are not evening the patient gender, the patient age, and you are reducing the power of the study by reducing, removing more than 2,000 of teeth. So um, I believe the tests themselves do compensations for this type of uh, big differences between groups. Uh, but obviously it would be much better if we could have sample sizes that were even, but uh, making that even could require also to make even other conditions such as demographic factors. So I think to perform that type of analysis, as uh, uh, I mentioned before, it would be very interesting to have something like a cohort study where indeed the exposed and non-exposed groups can be even in all the characteristics of the samples. In this case, we are just collecting the data according to what is available. And in this case, we just try to have the highest sample size possible so we could have a, a higher power. So obviously, all studies have limitations. That might be seen as one of the limitations, the cross-sectional study, which we have exposed that limitation in the end of the of the paper when we talk about the limitations of the study we expressed that. Um, but uh, that was the results that we were able to find.
Okay, Professor Ozgur Ozun, please. Uh, hello, doctor. Uh, I want to ask a question that uh, you made uh, two groups or three groups in this study. Because when I read the article, I understand that you have three groups. One, implant-supported crown model adjugant. One, natural tooth-supported crown model adjugant. And one, non-adjugant group. But when I see this table, uh, I saw that uh, in non-adjugant groups, you use both non-adjugant teeth and uh, adjugant uh, other compare groups. I mean, when I see the non-adjugant implant supported crown model, I see the number uh, and I thought that this was non-adjugant tooth, also adjugant natural tooth supported crown model. I, I, I mean that there, there must be three groups here. So I can compare the implant supported crown model adjugant numbers to do a natural tooth supported crown model adjugant numbers, but I cannot compare it. Okay, Georgia, please. You're, you're right on that point. So starting from the, the similar sample size, so the bigger one, the 22,000 teeth, okay? Um, we were able to collect the teeth that were, in this case, the adjacent and non-adjacent. So we had teeth that were adjacent and teeth that were not adjacent. So these are two groups. So these are only two groups. And then starting again from the big sample size, the 20,000 teeth, right? We also collect the data regarding adjacent and non-adjacent to, to supporting crown. So in this case, we had the bigger group which uh, was the group that had all the characteristics. And from that bigger group, we collected the teeth that were, and we divided it in, in this case, uh, two groups that were non-related to each other, which was the, the, the implant support crown model and the natural two support crown model. So the, the bigger large uh, sample size fitted in these two, all with the all teeth together. And then on that, we just split into groups the adjacent and non-adjacent. So although there is a, um, so obviously there are uh, teeth that are, uh, um, well, there are, basically was this. So in, in, in the end of the day, it's just two groups, the adjacent and non-adjacent to one model or to the other model. Okay. okay. I, uh, I don't know if I made myself clear or maybe I did not understand so well the question. No, I think uh, the question, Zoja, uh, was about non-adjacent teeth that you put them in comparison in two different ways. I think the reason is because speaking about the adjacent and non-adjacent is just a tooth close to the area that you are looking for. So in yes. reality, so you have one four is... groups rather than three groups, I believe. Am I right? In this case, we have four groups, but coming from the same original group. Yes. Yes, so that's fine. They, they, they mix some of the results, uh, some of the, the teeth that are adjacent from a, a tooth with model, uh, supported the crown model, might not be the adjacent ones on the implant support model. Yes. So we, from the original big sample, we made two models, one yeah. related to implant and another one related to support crowns, natural to supported crowns. I think as Dr. Vatampur said, and you also confirmed, this type of a study needs a, a very, very sophisticated uh, statistical advice. Yes. So you already received that advice. And I think usually in this type of discussion, we, we should have them as well with us to answer this type of questions. By the way, thank you very much, Georgia. Professor Hassam Mir Mohammadi from Netherlands, please. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Dr. Martin and uh, his colleagues uh, for this nice uh, article, as it gives us uh, some kind of evidence uh, for what we, yeah, for what we, it's a general belief, I think. And I think we need more and more of these uh, studies. Uh, my question goes about the comments uh, that you, uh, you just have about uh, uh, 
making a panoramic X-ray for watching, uh, uh, for, for keep watching, uh, uh, as you did a study with CBCT. So do you think with uh, panoramic, uh, we will come to the same data? Uh, no, I don't think the panoramic will get the same data. Um, I mentioned panoramic because uh, according to the um, uh, European Society and the uh, American Society of Endodontics, the x-rays should be the first choice to make the diagnosis. Uh, so when in, in our offices, I believe the first line of diagnosing should be the x-ray. Uh, but uh, I believe that also that uh, um, this, um, the, the, as, I, as I mentioned before, the sensibility uh, of our diagnostic of the CBCT as a, as a diagnostic to is superior to the panoramic, uh, to the, uh, in the detection of the periapical lesions. So uh, I, I believe the, the data collected by the CBCT are more reliable. Although we should use the, the panoramic as a, as a primary diagnostic tool, and that's what I, I mentioned, uh, in the end of the day, the, the CBCT must, must be more reliable. It takes us to uh, that question of whether should we not use the CBCT as a primary diagnostic tool. Well, in this case, we just follow the, the recommendations of, of, the, of, of the persons that uh, joined and defined the guidelines. Once they say that the CBCT is the proper diagnostic tool, or we start doing CBCTs to all patients, but uh, that's not the recommendation we have. So um, I believe that panoramic should be the first primary uh, diagnostic tool. But uh, I doubt if we could have the same uh, results because I, I believe that panoramic tool might not be the best uh, imaging technique to detect lesions. Good. Thank you very much. Dr. New, please go ahead, ask your question. Unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, thank you, Dr. For, invite, for invitation. Thank you so much, Dr. Nikopar. You're welcome. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, yeah. Actually, uh, as I see here, this uh, this is study has happened for more than 20,000 patients, more than 20,000 tooth. And we can see here in the periapical lesion, the numbers of non-adjacent people in the ambulance supported crown model is 2,171. It's like 9.7 percentage of the total. So from each 100 patient, we have 10 patients, they have periapical lesion after ambulance supported crown model. Is it true this? These results were the results that we were able to find. So when we go into a study like this, uh, we just uh, take a look at it on a very um, practical manner. So it has or it, or it does not have. So in this case, the results that we find is uh, the, the, the results that we present were the, the results that we found. Uh, and so we, we believe in these results, yes. So basically this, this, this was what we found. So it's a bit so, scary for you, Dr. Noor. I believe, yes, but Dr. Martin wants to scare us and wants to tell us very important thing. Yes, that yes, is the I, case. As Hesam said, we, we should thank him for that data. The objective is not to scare anyone, but uh, uh, the objective was to assess this on a non-definitive manner. As uh, it has been already expressed here uh, by some doubts that have emerged, so it's very important to understand that this is, uh, we believe this is not the definitive answer to the, to the point. This is uh, a type of study that was able to collect uh, one of the largest ever collect sample sizes. It's very important to assess this. Um, the, before our group, the largest sample size was from a Nordic country, Nordic, Northern Europe. Uh, country which I, uh, I cannot right now mention the name of the other, but before our studies, uh, the, the highest sample size to study periapical lesions was around 12,000 teeth. So we were able to do almost the double of it. 
trying to answer to this question or in a group of tools that are not so so much cases, which is teeth adjacent to implants. So the objective was to call the attention that this type of teeth deserve to be better screened. So as we have a special attention to previous good teeth, we should also have a special attention to these cases that, that are adjacent to natural tooth support crowns or implant support crowns. So we should have a look at them. So obviously, obviously the object is not to scare anyone, but uh, the object is to call attention to this factor. Okay, Dr. Noor, do you want to add anything? Yeah, uh, I have also another question about the natural tooth supported crown model. Uh, is this root? So we have just root and there is a crown above it. Is this root done on its root canal treatment because they are healthy tooth? The pulp, is it extracted pulp? This, uh, the nature to support it crown model, the root extracted pulp or they are saved by their bulb? Just okay. put it the crown. They are just uh, natural to support it with crowns. Where uh, it, we did not make a differentiation if they had, uh, because we were not assessing, we were not assessing uh, the tools that was having the crown. We assessed the tools that were adjacent or non adjacent, but not the tooth itself. So that tooth. So they are life. They are life tooth. No, the tooth. The tooth with crown could be. We are talking about the tooth with crown, right? The tooth with yeah. crown. The, the tooth with crown could be root treated or non root treated. The one with crown. Because that yeah. tooth was that tooth was not uh, uh, was not assessed. Okay, uh, I think uh, that's that's very good uh, explanation. We have the next question from Professor Burchin from Bakhtashehir University, Turkey. Burchin, please go ahead. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, very well. Uh, okay, if you're talking about the sensibility of the diagnosis, I have a question too. If we're talking about the sensibility, the authors used a huge voxel size range. I mean, seven to five to two, Hundreds. So I think it means that the details in the CBCT could be different. So if we are talking about the periodical scores from one to five, it means that the author may can may miss out the details in the 200 voxel size CBCT. So I think this huge voxel size can affect your results. Of course, in order to have a huge sample size, they have to use this uh cbc two together but what do you think about it can you think do you think that this huge voxel size range can affect your results well okay. the, the 200 meters voxel size is under the size of the the 0 0.5 millimeters uh so we believe that this voxel size is able to detect that kind of lesions uh, and we have followed uh, a previous study from uh, an author, which I believe is Kath. I'm, I'm not quite sure about, about this, I can double check. And he mentioned that the, 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 the sample size of 200 meters could be uh, advisable if you want to assess the periodontal ligament. So based on that, we, we have uh, uh, used the 200 uh, uh, meters. Uh, knowing that uh, if it was very much under the 0 0.5 millimeters, that would be our our limit. We trusted that this this could be a, a reliable uh, a box of size. But obviously, I agree with you. The better the image, the the lower the box of size, the better the the resolution. So it would be uh, easier to make the assessment. But in this case, we believe that 200 meters. Um, could give us um, reliable results. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. We are uh, in our 15th online journal club discussing about uh, what happened adjacent to uh, implant and chronally uh, restored tooth, uh, published by Professor Georgia Martins from Lisbon University and appraised by Dr. Dilek from Turkey, Ankara University. Thank you very much all for participating. We are going to have a quick break by watching a video from our sponsor. Zore, please go ahead.
Okay, Dilek, please carry on. Okay. And uh, I want to ask a question in here. Uh, my question is uh, the but, uh, from the bottom of the table. At the bottom, in the bottom of the table, uh, it is written that adjacent stands for both anterior and posterior positioning in relation to the assessed tooth. If there was primary outcomes, both sides of the related crown, uh, did you include the both teeth or uh, if you didn't, which one did you prefer? I'm curious about it. Mm. Uh, so in this case, the, it, it, uh, it reports to both. So imagine the, the implant was on, uh, on uh, 16, tooth 16. Uh, the, if there was a tooth on uh, position 15 and 17, we would take uh, uh, the assessment of, of both teeth. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you for the explanation. And I'm going on. Uh, let's uh, see the table four. Uh, in table four, uh, we saw the odds ratios and respective confidence intervals and p values of root canal filling, parapical lesion, and restored teeth in both implant and natural tooth supported models. For predictor one, the chances of a tooth present an endodontic treatment when adjacent to an implant supported crown is 2.57 and restored tooth is 1.63 times higher than when non-adjacent. And for predictor two, chances of a tooth present an endodontic treatment when adjacent to a, non, uh, to a natural tooth supported crown is 4.39 and for restored tooth, it is 2.30 times higher than when non-adjacent. And for parapical lesion, we saw that the odd ratios are similar both predictor one and for predictor two. And I want to pass the discussion. Let me just share Parts. something with you. Okay. Please, so please highlight is, the important things, Georgia, as well. Thank you. Okay. Yes, this is the, a table that uh, we changed when we have conducted the multivariable analysis. Mm. Uh, so, and th this was in order to have the patient, as I expressed before, the patient also into consideration. And uh, uh, on the, this analysis, we, we found that the, pay, the apical lesion was very even the odds ratio, as you can see, is almost one um, of uh, having or not a, a periodical lesion. And uh, you can see the, the odds ratio, that, which are very high. When you start talking about the odds ratio of two, means it's, it's the double of the chance of having, of having uh, that condition. So it's a, it's, it's a very high number. When you talk about four, 4.39, this is a huge difference. Um, the, uh, on this analysis, we saw that the periodical lesions became non-significant. However, allow me to highlight that uh, that uh, percentage, the proportion mm -hmm. that we had on the table three, as uh, as uh, Dr. Gillette uh, showed before, some of them were more more than the double. So, although we did not have difference here. That does not mean we should not uh, uh, have a look at them. Uh, I still trust that we should indeed have a look at them, but more questions have to be answered on longitudinal studies, as we mentioned before. Okay. Okay, Georgia, thank you very much. But be careful. When, when you speak about odds ratio, Dr. Vatampur is going to ask very harsh question. Dr. No Vatampur, please go ahead. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Okay, uh, only I, I want to emphasize uh, on this uh, matter that when we want to uh, talk about odds ratio and about risk factors, we should have two groups that uh, are matched with each other in confounding factors. But in this in this study, we have we hadn't match matched groups. And uh, at the uh, first of the study, we had only one group. And at the 
Uh, end of the study, we encounter with several groups and several analyses. I think it's a big uh, problem in this uh, statistical analysis. And I think um, we should have a logical explanation for this uh, odds ratio without some matching of the groups. So as I mentioned before, uh, we did not match the groups. So it's undeniable. You can see the study and you can understand it. So in the cross-sectional study, uh, that that is not uh, what we, we conducted. So um, uh, that would be something that we, we would indeed have attention, as I mentioned before, on a cohort study that we have to match the groups so we can understand the impact of uh, an exposure to a, a particular condition or particular group. Uh, in this case, we did not match the groups. In this case, we just collect the data and pull them according to the groups that we were uh, conducting. So uh, I obviously, obviously respect uh, uh, your opinion, and I'm going to try to address that. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned before, um, we have persons working on this that uh, just do this for in their lives, and they said it was okay to conduct this way, and we just did it. So, but obviously, I, I respect your opinion. Okay, thank you very much. And we have the next question by the Secretary of the Educational Committee of Asian Pacific and Atlantic Confederation, Dr. Uzge Ilke Ulusoy. Please go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Nekofar. Uh, hi, everyone. The topic of today is very uh, impressive. Uh, therefore, I co first congratulate the first author for this uh, interesting, very interesting article and uh, appraiser Dilek, <laughs> very Thank close you. friend. Thank you. Thank you yes. so much. Thank you. Uh, and Dr. Nekofar for his amazing uh, moderating as usual. Uh, I. I have a one question. I wonder if uh, the first author uh, for this question, did you record uh, the surgery treatment time of the implants or restorations or the root canal fillings? I think it's an impor important criteria for the study because for example, if the restoration of or the root canal filling had been performed prior to the implant surgery time, uh, the results maybe could be different and we couldn't draw such a conclusion, maybe. Uh, what do you think uh, of that, about this subject? Uh, in this case, the, um, you, you, you asked about the, if we uh, have- I, to... I think, Georgia, it is uh, almost uh, back to the methodology of the study that you mentioned in initiation. I, I I couldn't uh, see. Maybe am I? I am I? Uh, I am right. No, no, no. You are right. I think this is the question that I have received from a lot of participants in the chat yes, box yes, yes. typing to me as well. I think it's good to explain that again uh, about the limitation of this type of a study. Obviously, that we don't know which event happened before the other one, and I think you already covered that. But it's good to explain that again, because this is a very big question that everybody sent, me, sent to me as well. Please, Georgia. Okay. In this case, uh, we did not have into consideration the, uh, what has been previously conducted regarding uh, peripheral collisions, uh, regarding uh, uh, microsurgery, endodontic microsurgery. So we just assessed, as I expressed before, at that time that the CBCTs were, were conducted on that patient, if the patient had or not uh, a periapical lesion. So as I, uh, as I said before, the, this object, the, this study has done, does not have the ability, this study design does not have the ability to follow the patient one, uh, in, several, in multiple times. And this is, uh, this is obviously a problem, and this has been stated as a problem, because we indeed are not able to understand what happened before and what will happen after. We just know that at that particular point in time, we had in the groups of adjacent to implants, they had higher proportions of root canal fillings, they had higher proportions of peripical lesions, and they had other higher proportions 
uh, of restorations. This is the only thing we can assess. We cannot assess nothing more than that. So it's very important to make the interpretation of the results as they are. So it's very important not to try to remove from this study conclusions that this study cannot provide. So right. at, that, at that point in time, we have a higher proportion of root canal fillings, apical lesions, and restored teeth on the adjacent to uh, support, uh, to adjacent to, to implant. This gives us some indications of why, what might be happening on a long term. But if we want to have a better vision on the long term, we have to change the study design. So our objective is not to document something that the study does not have the ability to document. So it's very important to retrieve the information that can be retrieved from this study. So one point in time, it has these characteristics. Two of them were significant difference, which were the root canal filling and the restored, the restored teeth. We also had a very high proportion of lesions, but that was not considered statistically significant. That does not mean it's not important. It's just mentioned that regarding mathematics, okay, and this, this is dentistry, okay, or this is oral sciences, in mathematics, that's the difference was not different. So if you want to have to pay attention of the long term, you want to, to make sure that if the implant did really create the, uh, that extra root canal or that extra restoration or that extra apical lesion, the study design had to be different. It had to be a cohort, uh, a longitudinal study. This is a transversal study. So one point in time evaluation. We cannot assess what happened before, what happened after. We can go, it's like taking a photo, right? It's like taking a photo. Uh, if you want to see a, a relationship between a man and a woman, you have to make a video to see how they are handling, right? If you want to take just a photo, they might be working very bad and uh, they, are made, they might be smiling on that photo. So everything looks, yeah, we don't know what is going on behind it, right? This is exactly the photo. So if you want to know what happens behind it, you have to make a full video. You have to change the study design and make a longitudinal study. Very so nice. It's very think, important to retrieve. I think what you explained was amazing. Thank you very much. Because I think it's very important for all of us to know when we do some things, uh, we shouldn't increase our expectation from the data, but it gives us a lot of information. And the example, as you said, like a photo, I love that. Thank you very much, Jordi. You are a very good teacher. Because uh, I think this is what we want actually to tell others. Uh, looking at the Facebook and Instagram of the people, we think all the people are very, very happy. Nobody put the photos of the uh, pay, illness or, for example, if they don't have enough money to do something. We always think, oh, all the people around the world, they are happy, but they are not. So this is exactly what we have in cross-sectional studies. Fantastic, Georgia. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Vatampu. Uh, okay, thank you, Dr. Martin. Um, I believe in difficulties of such a study, but it is unclear matter for me that why you haven't calculated the um, correlation coefficient instead of these parameters because of your limitation. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm Georgia, sorry. you need to call your statistician for that. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 well, it's not available right now. No. <laughs> So I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so the suggestion is actually to add something to the statistical part or uh, give us some idea about what we can do in the future for that. Maybe if you find the answer, you can send it to me and I disseminate that to others as well. So Dr. Vatampur's question is very precise. And I know Dr. Vatampur is, in, is in, also one of the experts in a statistical analysis for all of our methodological things and in previous sessions also. So I thank him for being with us and give us this type of uh, uh, insight to the publications. Uh, but if you want to add anything, please go ahead, Georgia. 
Uh, I did not understand the question, I'm sorry. Okay, Dr. Vatampur, repeat it, please. Um, I, uh, I said that because of your limitation, I suggest that uh, I think it was better that you calculate uh, correlation coefficient instead of odds ratio or compare different okay. factors between your groups. Yes. Because you had one group and uh, several uh, factors that you can um, calculate correlation coefficient between different factors. And uh, in, in this case, no one can, no one can um, say why you had uh, these statistical tests. Well, uh, the object of these statistical tests was, uh, I understand your point. What you're meaning is that uh, you believe the tests would be different. I, I don't wanna go uh, against that comment, okay? Exactly, because as I told you, as I mentioned before, you can go around this one hour if you want, okay? Uh, as I told you before, the team is always backed up by a statistician, okay? Although I can do a lot of statistics in uh, sample studies, but when it comes to multivariable analysis, I don't do it myself. So I ask someone to come to bring their expertise and to conduct this. So uh, if you think the statistical analysis should have been different, it's something that I respect what you say. Uh, the only thing that I have to say is that we were backed up by a statistician, which is not a dentist, is a PhD in statistics. That does not mean anything, obviously, but uh, I, I trust him. And this has been true, the statisticians from the journal, uh, which has one statistician that uh, has one reviewer, which is the last reviewer. So the, the International Don't Journal has multiple reviewers and one of them is the statistical reviewer. And uh, he made some concerns that made us to change a few things. Uh, and uh, so there is nothing more that I can add regarding doing what's ratio or another statistic. I totally respect it, okay, your, your opinion. Maybe there are other ways to do things. Maybe there are multiple ways to do the analysis. We know that there are multiple ways to do the analysis. And we know that sometimes we have multiple tests that, that we can use to answer some questions depending on the question. So it doesn't, uh, uh, it, uh, it doesn't uh, surprise me if someone thinks that we should have done another approach. That is something that does not surprise me. All over these years, I have seen that already happen. So um, that does not surprise me if someone comes and say, you know what, you, you should have done this test instead, instead of this one. Um, I, I, I'm completely open-minded regarding that. And I think that statistics is a very precise area, but there are more than one ways to do the things. So maybe the way that you should, uh, maybe the way that you, you could have uh, um, choose was different than the way that we have chosen, that we have chosen. In this way, well, we believed on the person that was working with, uh, with us and uh, the journal has made their comments, which we have addressed and uh, ultimately um, our statistic was accepted by one of the most relevant journals of, of the world. So um, I totally respect your opinion, but in this case, I cannot give you no more information unless I call my statistician as Professor uh, Mohamed Nikopar said. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. New, please go ahead quickly because we have very limited time. Dr. New. Okay, sir. Actually, you are said a lot of, about the limitation uh, of this article, of this study. Uh, my question that about the implant. I'm interested in implant, really. Uh, actually, as I'm see here in the statistical, there is less than 10,000 patients, they have implants. And this kind of implants that make like less than 2,000 uh, lesion in the, each variable of this kind of implant. Uh, can I say that maybe we, if we are using different kind of implants, because we have many kinds of dental implants, is it a problem? Is it effect? Is it change? Maybe you use ju just one, one kind of implant and you saw all of these problems. Maybe we can't change the company. We can change the another type of this implant. Maybe the 
all of this will be changed. What's your opinion? Okay, good not, question. Uh, Georgia, please. We, that is a very good question. Uh, and that uh, is a very good comment. And it's indeed a, a, a very interesting uh, uh, way to, to proceed to proceed with the with the with the research path, trying to understand if this applies to all implants or just to a specific implant. Well, we did not address the type of implant. We did not address address the type of material that uh, was was uh, making the crown. Um, so that is one of the data that we we did not screen. So it's very, as I said before, it's important to retrieve from the study that information that are there. And that information was not assessed, so it's something that I cannot answer. So if that would require a different approach, but uh, I don't know. In my, I'm going to give you my personal opinion, okay? Which is not evidence based. It's just my personal opinion. I don't know if the implant uh, could make uh, such a big difference. Um, but in the end of the day, well, we. We are not sure. We have to test the hypothesis. Okay, Actually, can we carry... know? Yeah, can we know which kind of company in Milan that you used in this study? These were uh, eleven clinics, so eleven clinics have more than much more than one or two or three implants. Uh, we did not assess the type of implant. We just assessed if it was an implant or not, and uh, this was not just one single clinic. So if it was so the clinic it... that. Uh, is it the companies from France or South Korea? Because here we are facing a lot of imbalance from the South Korea, from France, and from Germany also. Well, I can There's tell you what uh, what is more uh, used in Portugal. I think the major groups in Portugal are Nobel and Strauman, but uh, there are minor uh, there are minor uh, companies working uh, in Portugal too. So um, I can give you that information, but that does not necessarily represent the group that we assessed. Okay, thank you very much. And I think, uh, Jorge, the important thing is that Dr. New tried to say is that uh, I should add something that maybe the type of the crown and the contour of the crown, and as you said, the lack of the contact can be the effect of these problems as well. So therefore, for the tooth that they have crown, we need to analyze the quality of the crown to make it complete as well. So this is very difficult. These type of studies are very difficult studies because we need to register everything and write down everything and then evaluate them statistically. Then it comes to the type of the statistical analysis. Obviously, you did a very, very, big job, I would say, very large data, dealing with this large data is amazing. But uh, that would be good to know that, for example, if there is an overhang for the crown, that may have some effect on the result uh, comparing to the one with a good contour or no overhang, good adaptation to the wall of the canal or other things like that. So uh, I think each variable may have its own effect. Uh, do you agree with me about that? I totally agree with you. I totally okay. agree with you. Um, that all those factors may be indeed very important. Uh, in the introduction, we spoke about the, I mean, discussion also just a little bit about the contact point, as, uh, as Dr. Gillette mentioned, we spoke about that. Well, we don't know if the contact points of that particular teeth adjacent to the crowns or to the implants. Uh, with crown if they were correct or not so we were just debating the issue that was something that we did not evaluate and probably it's something that we cannot evaluate on a cbct that is something that you have to evaluate cl clinically so that might be one good point to evaluate uh, as i said before in another study design uh, following in this case another uh, a different methodological assessment so the, in, in that case we might not even be talking about the cbct assessment we might yes. be, we might need a, a clinical a true clinical assessment um, but uh, the, as i mentioned before we did not assess that and it's very important also to to think about one thing uh, as i said before we had to collect more than 20000 uh, samples which is almost the double 
of the maximum that had been collected before our studies. And even though we had a small sample size, as it was expressed previously by the professor, um, if we go on and uh, if we start uh, splitting that smaller sample size of 500 teeth on smaller groups, like uh, types of implant, uh, which can be understood by an, an experienced implantologist, which is not my case, uh, by CBCT, I believe in CBCT. Well, not in CBCT, in extra, maybe CBCT because of the artifacts of the metal, they might not be able to understand which implant they are talking about. But probably to the, probably in, if the clinics did that implant, they might have that registered. Uh, that would take us to a different story. I don't know how, how much that would violate the ethics because we, we should, we had to assess the information from the patients. Yes, yes. Um, but uh, what, I, what I was meaning, even if we can detect the implants through the imaging techniques, it's important not to over split what is already small. So if we are dealing already with a smaller sample size and we have to collect a large volume of data so we could have a, 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 sim, a small but reliable sample. If we go on and split it over again, we would end up requiring 1 million samples, which is maybe infeasible. So okay, obviously- Thank you very much. George, I'm a bit worried about the time because mm -hmm. we already- uh, yeah, Just time, one last okay. point, just, so one last point. just a minute, please, quick. Yeah. Actually, uh, the the last mention that you mentioned it about the crown, it's really smart. You are smart, the Dr. Nikofar. When we say that maybe the crown is the affected on the roots or the implant. My question that uh, what's the what's the kind of crown that he used? That, does he use the metal ceramic or zirconium or high IMAX? What's the kind? Or and all the patients they have the same type of the crown, or he did different type from different version of the crowns. Okay, that information, as I mentioned, to the implants, that was not assessed. That may indeed uh, make a difference or not. We don't know because we did not assess that information. And it's something that we cannot assess on a CBCT. I cannot look at the CBCT and say if that is zirconia or if that is another type of uh, ceramic. Uh, so we did not assess that information. That information should uh, would have to be retreated from a, a clinical observation to the patients, which was not what we did. So we just did a simple collection of that on CBCT. I think, Georgia, that you did a good job because you leave some more questions for these young fellows to <laughs> do some more research. Dr. Noor, it is your turn to start doing other research and publish it. Then we put you in this hot chair. Thank you very much for your question. Dilek, please make it very quick. Okay. Uh, I want to continue with the discussion part of the study. And in the discussion part of the study, you stated that cancers in teeth adjacent to implants are also reported mainly related to proximal decay and uh, periodontal disease, which are attributed to the lack of long-term stability of interproximal contact and or narrow implant platforms and natural teeth may be subject to some psychologic movement whereas the implant is ankylosed, which over time results in the loss of interproximal contact between both structures. Very nice. uh, and in previous studies, implant tooth distance was reported as an important factor, as you see in here in this picture. When implant body is narrow, the implant tooth distance increases, as you see in here, and such conditions make it difficult to properly clean, favoring plaque retention and foot trapping at those interproximal surface, resulting in a higher susceptibility of animal tissue to, uh, to demineralization and decay or even periodontal disease. And when I took a look at uh, to the reference of this study, some of them were took my attention. The first one is uh, this article, which was uh, carried out by Smith et al. This was a retrospective study, which reviewed radiographs of 300 Muller's implants placed over an 11 year period. And they reported that a critical implant tooth distance was four millimeters. 
in here. And the other article uh, in the references is this study, which was carried out by Bugum et al. And this study was a retrospective chart review, and they examined survival and changes in coronal pulp and pericardial status of teeth adjacent to implant and contralateral tooth. And they concluded that teeth adjacent to implants have a higher rate of restorative retracement as compared to controls. And these two studies uh, results were consistent with the Dr. Martin's article. And the last one is uh, Kranmeyer et al. conducted a clinical follow-up study which published in 2003 and they examined 78 single tooth implants and 148 adjacent teeth for uh, 58 months and they reported that the crown and periodontal studies of teeth adjacent to single implant restoration were, was excellent. And this article's results uh, were, was inconsistent with the, uh, Dr. Martin's article. Uh, and uh, I want uh, to ask a question uh, with the, uh, about the table four to the author. Uh, in this and previous articles, as I mentioned before, it was mentioned that a tooth adjacent to an implant supported crown has some disadvantages, like unclosing of implant and loss of proximal uh, contact in progress of time. Uh, but in table four, we saw that odds ratio of natural tooth supported crowns were higher than uh, the natural tooth uh, odds ratio of natural tooth supported crowns. Uh, sorry, uh, we saw that the odds ratio of natural to supported crowns were higher than implant supported crowns model. Uh, and uh, so how can uh, we explain this and what is com uh, your comment in this context? My comment is that uh, this was a big surprise to us. Okay. Um, our uh, main target because of the this uh, eternal discussion between the implant and natural tooth was our target was indeed the implant assessment. So we want to know what was going on near the implant because uh, as everyone has probably noticed, uh, once in a while you see that the caries uh, very near to the enamel uh, and cementum junction, you see that caries, very deep caries near the implant. It's a very typical caries um, near the implant, the, the teeth that are adjacent to implant. And when looking to that caries, that, that was the, the reason behind the study. Is if the, those caries happen there, if there are typical caries adjacent to implants, um, we should address these multiple points that may compromise the future of the teeth, the long-term prognosis of these teeth that are adjacent to implants. And if, during the, the role of, the, of the, the study, we decided also to evaluate if there was a difference between uh, being near the implant or being near a tooth that had a crown, yeah. because both had crowns. Um, but we did not test the difference between these groups. Um, and uh, I cannot uh, give you a proper justification why natural teeth, uh, the teeth adjacent to natural teeth with crowns have uh, a higher uh, proportion and a higher prevalence and a higher odds ratio when compared to the other teeth of the adjacent to implants. We know that the, to the, uh, in the literature, there are always consistent results and there are always inconsistent results to previous studies. Uh, that is why we join the knowledge on on pool on pool on, on a pool knowledge. That is the objective of the systematic reviews. For instance, systematic reviews pool the results that one favor, the others don't favor, and in the end we have a, a pooled result of what, what might be reality. So studies that are inconsistent to others, it's not something that scares me. Because what uh, bothers me more is the globality of the results of all those studies combined. Uh, and uh, so this inconsistency of one study uh, does not bother me that much. And uh, I cannot give you a proper justification of why we found this, we just found it. 
because it's important to understand that uh, we always like to give some justifications of the findings, even to understand if this makes sense or if it does not make sense. But at the end of the day, the, the objective of this particular study was not to find the justification, was to find the result. And then we debate the result on the discussion. It's very important to try to understand the justification so we, we, we can understand what happened, so we can try to correct or generate new hypotheses for new studies. Uh, so in this case, we just uh, report the data that we found. Uh, I must admit that it was something that surprised me, these results. Uh, regarding the difference between these two groups, adjacent implant or adjacent to natural, natural tools with crown. But I cannot, uh, uh, after thinking a lot with the whole group, we just cannot give a proper justification why uh, uh, this happens this way. Yeah, obviously it, it needs more clinical studies as well. Thank you very much, yes. Georgia. Dilek? Okay, I'm going on. Yeah, you know what? Uh, it, it, might oh. be as, it might be as simple as what was said before. Uh, it might be as simple as the, if the, 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 the adaptation of the crown on a tooth is as perfect as the adaptation of an implant and crown. Because you know the implant and crown, they have the attachments that comes from the factory and they all attach together. So probably they are very well connected and the gaps are very small. And you don't know if there are things that may happen differently when you take the, the, the impression of the natural tooth and you send to the lab and the lab adapts something to your, to your tooth, which is not a piece that was made on a factory that is supposed to adapt on the implant. So it might be something related to that, but we did not assess that. Okay, thank you. Okay. I'm going on. Uh, now I want to uh, talk about cross-sectional studies a little bit. Uh, you know that uh, this article was a cross-sectional study and uh, it has some advantages and disadvantages. Uh, and a cross-sectional study is, uh, we all know that, a type of observational study that analyzes data from a population or a representative subset at a specific point in time and often used to assess the prevalence of conditions or diseases. And cross-sectional studies may involve spatial data collection, including questions about the past, but they often rely on data originally collected for other purposes. But there are some disadvantages of uh, cross-sectional studies have, and these are cross-sectional studies are very susceptible to recall bias and cannot be used to answer the causes of diseases or the results or, uh, of intervention. And today's article's conclusion was the prevalence of root canal treatments and coronal restoration is higher when the tooth is adjacent to either implant or natural tooth supported crowns. So can we interpret this conclusion as implant or natural tooth supported crowns as a cause of root canal treatment and coronal restoration. I want to ask that to the yeah. Dr. Martin. George, <laughs> please answer answered that very clearly because <laughs> this is very important. Be careful. <laughs> if you want me to answer clearly, I will say no. No, obviously. perfect. <laughs> obviously. Uh, that is I'm worried very... about Dr. Vatambu. Dr. Vatambu would kill you if you say yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is obviously a very important question. And this is obviously uh, the question that, uh, well, I will say that uh, a person that is not so um, uh, not so devoted or so, uh, does not have um, uh, uh, an, an expertise on uh, research or that reads the manuscript with a lower paying lower attention to what is being written could make this conclusion. So exactly. uh, if this means that the, the implants leads to uh, an, a, a higher ratio, ratio of uh, root canal treatments and coronal restoration, that is not what we are talking about. We cannot, uh, the, the only uh, answer to this question, the, the answer is no. So we cannot understand if the implant caused more root canal treatments and coronal restoration. We can say is that when we gathered information at one point in time, this was what was happening. So, uh, and that is very important to understand what is being written on the paper. 
and the, what is being written on the paper is not that implants creates more root canals or restorations or failure collisions. What we say is that in that one moment in time, they have more, a higher percentage. This may be expectulated that something might be going on. Something might be going on, but uh, that requires a different assessment. So this paper may justify an investment which might be related to time, might be related to, to uh, research uh, fees uh, that may lead to a uh, further research to match that we want to get the support from ethics commission to get a fee so we can uh, develop a, cro a cross-sectional study. Okay, this can support that fee, that can support that further study uh, because something appears to be going on, but we cannot make this direct assumption that implants lead to higher percentage of root canal treatment or no restorations. Thank you very much indeed. But I think, uh, Jose, it was to think about correlation coefficients, as Dr. Vatampur said, and uh, consult that with your statistician. And if you want to add something to that, please disseminate it to us, and we will put that in the website. Thank you very much indeed. Dilek, is there anything else that you want to add, or it was your last? Um, yes, uh, thank all of you. <laughs> Thank you. And joining Thank you. Us. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, okay, we had amazing discussion. Thank you very much, yes. everybody. And uh, what am I going to say? First of all, I need to say a big thanks to uh, this gentleman, Professor George Martin. <laughs> you did really, really very good discussion. Thank you are you one of Thank the authors much. that we are really very proud because. Uh, First things that I should say, you are a very, very gentleman, a humble author. You did a very great job. In Endo, we need a lot of, uh, to be honest, uh, evidence like that. So we put our hand together and we uh, honorably give you this certification on behalf of uh, Asian Pacific and the Donnelly Confederation Educational Committee and also Tehran University of Medical Sciences for accepting our invitation and hope to join us in our future uh, programs. And then this time you put in the chair of Dr. Vatampur and start criticizing <laughs> others. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank Martin. you very much. Thank you very much. You are amazing. Amazing, honestly, much. honestly, because I did the job for more than two, two, 27 years doing online journal clubs and around three years speaking directly in this platform with authors, and you are one of the best. You are one of the best. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. And then Thank I think much. it's time to say a big thanks, a very, very big thanks to Dr. Ozgur Ozun. Do you know why? Because Dr. Ozun was the one actually who told me about DILEC, and he was actually the professor of Dr. Dilek Oze, our uh, assistant professor from Ankara thank University. You. Osgur, thank yes. you very much for introducing Dilek to us. And I, ha I had this honor actually to meet her in uh, Turkish Endodontic Society Conf uh, Association Conference in Mar Marlin, and uh, she is fantastic. Dilek, your presentation, I'm sure George should say something about your presentation. George, please, you go ahead. <laughs> Uh, we well, are speaking about Dilek now. Okay, uh, Dr. Dilek made a, a very uh, good presentation of the study. Thank you so much. Uh, and she was able to understand very precisely what the study was about. And I could understand that not only by the last question, which obviously is the major question, uh, when you think about uh, what conclusions to take from this study, but also uh, on the topics that decided to, to bring to debate and the way she uh, created the PowerPoints, always aiming for the major points, uh, which were indeed uh, the ones more relevant. So uh, part of the success of this evening was indeed the fact that she was able to bring it and to expose exactly the hot topics that we tried okay, to Okay, so we put so our hand together. For Dr. Dilek Ozer. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank Dilek, you. for your Thank very you nice presentation. So much. And 
thank we you send so you much. this presentation to say thanks. So <laughs> thank uh, you usually so we have some uh, final words. So I'm going to ask uh, Professor Merich Kazanda for final words and Dr. Vatampur as well. Merich, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Martin. It was really a fantastic discussion. Uh, I admit that there are some limitations. However, I believe that this is a very right question, correct question to ask uh, the question of your uh, research. There is a lot to do on that. Uh, so thank you very much for this pioneering study. Thank, thank you, you thank you. Words. And I'm sure Dr. Vatampur is also very happy to have this article in endodontics publication, obviously with all the limitations. Dr. Vatampu. Surely. Uh, thank you, Dr. Martins. It's a very, very good uh, opportunity to be more familiar with you and with your thank article. You. And I'm sure that uh, such art conducting such article is so difficult. And uh, these discussions is, a, uh, is an opportunity for me to learn more and more. Uh, thank you so much for your, uh, for your article. Thank you, thank, very you very thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Dr. Osgur Ozun, please, you yeah. go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dr. Martin, for this wonderful article and wonderful work. And uh, also, thank you all for this lovely evening. Yes, Martins. You are a very good teacher, good author, and good leader for the research. I know you very well. So I want you to end the session yourself. The stage is yours. Well, uh, I would like to thank very much for the opportunity to be here. And uh, most of all, uh, you, there are a lot of research that is coming in nowadays. Uh, and uh, the, the fact that you were able uh, to select one of our studies on a, on a model uh, for a, such an important organization. Uh, it's, it was an honor to receive this invitation and to see that uh, you were able to uh, notice our study, you were able to understand the relevance of our study, and you, uh, it was uh, strong enough for you to decide to address here on a format that has limitations, obviously, you cannot assess all the studies that are coming in uh, and be one of the studies of 2022 that you decide to address, it was a big honor. So I thank you very much for that. And I thank you very much for all the comments. Uh, I agree with Dr. Van Tampur that uh, this is a platform to grow. So, um, and uh, one of the things of a, a good professor is the fact that a good professor is able to be also a good learner at the same time. Um, so learning and teaching is a, it's a, a, cross, a cross path. So um, I agree with that. So thank you very much for your invitation. It was uh, such an honor to be here with you guys. Okay, everybody, thank you very much. We end up our session right now. And before say goodbye, Zohra is going to show us some videos from our sponsor. And uh, we gradually say goodbye to each other. Martin, good luck and have a Bye. very good evening. Bye.
Okay, goodbye everybody and have a very, very nice evening. Georgia, again, thank you very much. I wish you all of the best. We really learn from you. We really learn from your manner, your way of dealing with us, answering our difficult and sometimes very harsh and direct questions. We learn from you, honestly. Thank you very much. We had a very nice evening, wonderful time. And thank you very much everybody for joining us. Stay with us for the next months in another amazing discussion that we will have. Dilek, you did a very good job. Honestly, 100 out of 100. Thank you, everybody, and goodbye.